I'm Josh Montgomery, the CEO of Mycroft AI, and this is my co-founder, Chris Adair, who acts as our CFO, and our other founder, uh, Derek Schweppe, who's our Chief Design Officer. We're here to talk to you today about the where Mycroft came from. The creation story. So this was an idea of mine that I wanted to share out. Uh, I know in several instances we've talked about uh, some of the things and some of the reasons why we started Mycroft and I really just wanted to invite the gentleman to talk about why originally Mycroft came to be, what the impetus was. You know, it's been really two years since you started playing around and had the idea. And so I wanted to have Joshua share originally uh, why you started tinkering with it and then how we um, got to know Derek and how he became such an integral part of the team. So you want to give us a start? Okay, so uh, let's start off. So this is the second time we've done this today, so I'm, I think I'm repeating myself. Um, we did another one that was live and there was a microphone malfunction and then the thing died. So the 11 people who watched it live, uh, you guys got to see the rehearsal for what we're doing now. <laughs> Uh, so to talk a little bit about uh, Mycroft and, and where we are and what we're doing. Um, so the, the concept with the, with the beginning was to take the space we're actually sitting in right now and turn it into a place where you could speak to an on-site AI. Uh, the place where we are today is the Warren Center for Entrepreneurship. It's a place that we started with that concept that we would give entrepreneurs in the community surrounding the University of Kansas a place to come where they could have offices and um, we also have a makerspace on site and a data center so they could start a business that maybe makes a physical product or a data product or even have a service business and um, and have that business uh, here and have really low overhead in terms of, of paying for office space and we don't really have a super fancy space the way that uh, we work does in a lot of cities or the way that uh, some of the other fantastic um, co-working spaces I've seen this past year uh, have. So instead, we wanted to do something that was really kind of new and novel. And I, I want to give a shout out to uh, Dave Dalton at Hammerspace, who had this idea before me. So uh, Dave, I, I you know always steal from the best, right? <laughs> um, so Dave had a technology called Iris in his makerspace, which is Hammerspace in Kansas City. And Iris is based on some legacy micro Microsoft technology. Uh, and it has some uh, some push buttons and things. You can hit the button and it plays messages in his makerspace. Uh, you can use it to, to order stuff and it's got a bunch of in-jokes about how and whatnot. And I saw that and I thought, you know, we could go one better. And so we came back and we started doing homework to see if we could take Siri and uh, put it in a, in a space like this or Cortana or Assistant. And you know, what we found was that the the existing solutions were uh, walled off, proprietary, secretive. We couldn't actually uh, do any work with them uh, and customize them. And uh, when we started to do some more investigation, we realized that uh, even within the open source community, uh, there were no really good solutions. Uh, we played with uh, Stephen uh, Hickson's uh, voice command software, which is written in C, uh, and we, we were able to get something working, but it really didn't have the user experience that we wanted. And uh, we also played with Jasper a little bit, but once again, uh, the user experience wasn't really what we were looking for as a team. And, uh, and we really wanted to build something, something better. So uh, we set out to, uh, to write a new solution uh, in Python, something that was, would be extensible. And uh, all of the people here that were working on it, and this was a side project, you know, as an open source community, we were looking to stand up. Uh, we all had a little Raspberry Pi on our desk, and then we also had a... Uh, a wireless speaker or a wired speaker on our desk and then we also had a microphone on our desk uh, with a big long long mass of cables and so by the time all this stuff was plugged together and wired up and you had a power strip and a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, power wall works for 12 volt power and 5 volt power it really was a big mess on everybody's desk so we said okay well let's put this in an enclosure and at the time, I'd been watching uh, Guy Hoffman's videos. If you haven't watched them, you should go out and have a look at Guy's videos about building robots that enjoy music and building robots that can interact with people in an anthropomorphic way. And, uh, and so I was inspired by that to go and do something that was a little different from kind of the vanilla cut and dry solution that, that Siri has. Um, it's really very corporate and narrow and there's very little that's subjective. Um, it's a fantastic solution for the problem that Apple is solving, but it wasn't really the solution for the problem that I was looking to solve, which was to have 
uh, an AI in the space that, that really inhabited it and branded it and allowed you to interact with it in new and novel ways. So originally, I'd been playing with these blue snowball mics, and so I thought, well, having the microphones separated from the speaker is a good idea. Um, even though we put them in the same enclosure, I'm still going to go back to <laughs> having them separated is a good idea. Yeah. And um, uh, and so we developed uh, this little guy as a proof of concept that to kind of on our 3D printer to really kind of show show what something might look like. It's actually supposed to be uh, just like the snowball microphone. Uh, in the base would be the speaker and the electronics, and then the microphone would be up here. Uh, in this case, it may or may not have had a camera. Uh, you can see, maybe you can't see, but uh, it drew a little mouth on here, which is supposed to be a screen. Uh, and so I took that and refined that a little bit uh, to uh, something that was a little bit uh, more detailed. Uh, in this case, I drew some eyelids on it. Um, I changed the, 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 uh, the volume a little bit. Um, I changed the shape of the neck to be a little, uh, to use polyconic surfaces and, and some stuff like that. Um, and then in the mouth was supposed to be a little display that could display text for the end user. Um, so this was kind of, once again, another little mock-up um, that we printed on the 3D printer really rapidly uh, to kind of see what something might look like. And so then we get into the, the real deal, something that actually would work. And, uh, you know... When you CAD things up, a lot of times they look smaller on the CAD screen than they do when you actually print them. So in this case, it actually fit the Snowball microphone. Electronics would fit inside it. Um, we'd feed the cables down to all the, the electronics in the bottom. You can see there's a slot cut here so that we can pull the CF for the Raspberry Pi in and out. And the Raspberry Pi is really kind of a limiting form factor for us, at least in here, because... When you use a Pi and you use a you know the standard USB A type connectors, uh, the boot of the connector really adds another you know an inch or so to the size of the Raspberry Pi. Um, when you add an inch here, and then for the HDMI cable you add another inch there, and you have an Ethernet port, and you have a power supply and a speaker, you end up with a fairly sizable volume. Um, this is about six seven inches across um, at the base. And so we were playing with that, and simultaneously, because we run an entrepreneurship center, we had a lot of traffic of people coming in with terrible ideas that they wanted to take to Kickstarter. And um, we had never really gone to Kickstarter to do a project and, and didn't know much about it. Our, our prior businesses um, were really funded in a very traditional way. And, uh, and so we decided that we wanted to do a Kickstarter, and uh, we went out to start doing our due diligence. Um, originally, we went to talk to Meredith, and what's the name of her store? Wonderfair. Wonderfair. Downtown runs a, Lawrence. Yeah, runs a great store called Wonderfair in downtown Lawrence. Meredith had done a, a Kickstarter where uh, she had started a secret society called the Black Diamond, Black Diamond <laughs> Society. Uh, if you haven't ever seen it on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, I encourage you to go look for it. Uh, Meredith raised, I think, a little north of $10,000 to start a secret society. Um, her favorite perk is one that I still quote today when I talk about Kickstarter is for $1,000, you too could be the secret benefactor of a, of a secret society. And I thought that was, a, that was a great perk, which she actually sold. She did amazing at it. And a lot of what we learned from Meredith was that uh, so much of it is about the presentation and really people under, you know, being excited about the product. Yep. And simultaneously, so I run an internet service provider, and we do gigabit fiber to the home. And I'd been out at uh, our data center over on Stratford Road, and this older gentleman uh, kept coming around to ask questions and uh, uh, provide hints uh, about what we were doing. A gentleman by the name of Earl Schweppe, uh, who is a former uh, computer science professor at KU, a wonderful gentleman uh, who'd really seen the birth of the computer, the birth of the silicon chip, right? The, the introduction of the transistor through his career. Um, you know, I had worked with uh, luminaries in, uh, in software development, luminaries in computer science over the course of a 30 plus year career. And, uh, and Earl was such a great guy and uh, it just kind of tickled my fancy uh, to upgrade his internet at his home from what he was getting from the cable company to a gigabit full duplex connection. So um, so we dug some conduit over by Earl's house and spent way more money than we'll ever recover on the site just to see uh, that Earl kind of, um, Earl's career span from, you know, the very birth of the modem 
uh, to having a gigabit full duplex uh, connection at his home with, uh, you know, multi-frequency uh, hopping focused Wi-Fi for his his computer so that he can he can do his research and surf the internet uh, on his own. So I've been talking to Earl and, and he mentioned that his grandson Derek had uh, this is Derek. <laughs> uh, had done a, a successful Kickstarter, and that's where, where we brought Derek into the project. Yeah, so I had done a Kickstarter oh, about a year before um, for an IoT product in Kansas, and it done pretty well, over 100000 and I learned uh, a lot about just the IoT space and about how to do a Kickstarter, so we did the video, uh, we did a lot of promotion through social media, and did some design work. Um, I'm an industrial designer uh, as a background, um, and so, Getting that introduction to IoT, started learning about you know what can voice do uh, for these things because all the apps and stuff that you need to control, IoT is kind of a, a problem. And so when my grandfather Earl told me about this project, some voice kind of thing that they were doing, they wanted to take the Kickstarter. I was like, well, that sounds interesting. I'll, I'll, so I literally went over the same day, like probably within hours after I talked to uh, Earl, and. Saw this prototype, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> this was a prototype that they had, and it was working. Um, and at the time, I I don't know if I'd actually heard of like the Echo product, but I definitely was familiar with Siri and familiar with, and I knew the power of voice was going to be pretty pretty interesting. And it was still very early. And to have the working prototype, you could ask it, you know, what's the weather like and other things, and it was working, was really impressive and. The model actually, the engineering going into it, um, getting all the parts in there, I, you know, I was like, you know what, these guys, we can make this, we, we can make this into something, I think. And uh, the challenge for me was trying to sell them also on the idea of, of maybe going back and doing some more design work. <laughs> I don't so, think that took too much time yeah. because that was not a few days later I heard about it. If you're, if you're, not, if you're a designer, that's always the thing you don't want to. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of like technical concerns that we were thinking about too, just in terms of scale and trying to get to manufacturing. There's a term called um, design for manufacture when you want to think about part count and things like that, which we still have a lot of lessons to learn, but we've definitely, from here to there, have made some good decisions in terms of scale and things like that. But um, the concept of trying to make something relatable, anthropomorphic was, was strong, uh, character-based. Um, I thought all that was great. We just kind of, I, I suggested maybe we go back to the drawing board and we started just, Josh and I, um, sitting down talking about things like Wally, Eve, Big Hero 6, characters like that, that uh, in pop culture, um, you know, people really related to, you know, they, uh, they were, you know, cute, but not necessarily, um, you know, too specific. Uh, so anyway, the point is I'm trying trying to get to is we kind of evolved the design to this was one of the early proof of concept just models that we made um, that you know could kind of look like a nice product that would sit on uh, your your bedside table or on a kitchen counter, but also when lit up would have a face uh, and things that you could relate to. Um, so we were thinking about digital face here with LEDs, um, LED rings for eyes things like that. And we we're also thinking about this always still from that kind of maker, um, maker space point of view in that we were going to expose ports, we were going to use parts like all our original parts came from Adafruit, um, things like that that you could get off the shelf. We wouldn't have to go to a big manufacturer and say, hey, we need these custom electronics made. And then they'd have to come back and say, well, you know, you're going to need to place an order of 5,000 for us to do that. So we were always looking at how can you make a product with at least some kind of off-the-shelf components. Um, so we evolved from this, uh, which was just kind of proof of concept form factor, to this, which actually had all the parts in it, had the pie in there. Um, this is what we ended up using to film the, the Kickstarter video. And then from there, he, you know, we went back and we learned, like this was printed with an FDM machine. Um, which it was around a thousand dollars and you know the equivalent now would maybe even be uh, a couple hundred dollars cheaper so the 
the barriers to entry on this are really low now. Um, you can make, you know, that was a lot of sanding for me to do to actually make it. Uh, and you can see the, the difference. But, so for the Kickstarter video, we sanded, bonded the top and painted it. The bottom didn't need to be sanded and bonded, so you can actually <laughs> you can see, see the, the, difference. the striations just from the various different layers. Next to each other, you Levels, can tell. Layers, so. But you don't need to bondo and sand every model, so you can do a lot of rapid iteration, and this is only a handful of the ideas that we went through in the evolution of the process. So we have a, like a shelf of the history of, of Mycroft in the back. Um, and then here we have off the tool um, pre production with the full electronics and everything. Um, so, you know, if you will go back and watch the video that I did, you'll hear a little bit more about some of the electronics and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's been a challenge. Um, it's been a learning process, but I think we definitely uh, succeeded in, in kind of doing the anthropomorphic qualities while still embracing a kind of maker product. Um, you still have all of the ports and everything from the Pi. You have the USB access. Um, these these uh, plates that we used, instead of doing like a molded part there that could come out flush maybe and uh, be a little bit more like what you know you might see from Amazon or from some other manufacturer. Um, but then if we did something like that, we would abandon the idea of you as the consumer being able to customize it, laser cut your own part. Maybe you even laser cut like a green piece that's clear or something to make it your own, um, even on the back plate, we, you can laser cut um, and replace that. Um, we've got ports on the sides that allow you to get in there. So this is, I think we've kind of tried to strike, strike a balance between a maker product that you can hack and customize and something that would also just be okay in the general you know, tech enthusiasts um, home as well, or general consumer even. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of how I've got involved. Obviously now the, the company we've brought from just this product, this is really the origin of how we got started. Um, now we have, you know, we didn't have any consumers other than ourselves in mind here. Uh, now we have real people out there using Mycroft in uh, other various forms, Pycroft, desktop, um, there's a Jaguar running my car right now. <laughs> Jaguar, Jaguar F type. So right. So yeah. from here to where we are now, um, it's been really interesting. But this is where it, where it all started. Yeah. So um, so the one thing I did want to ask. So so when we brought Derek in, uh, he had just gotten done running the biggest Kickstarter in Kansas history. So uh, we went out and kind of set a high goal and ended up running the biggest Kickstarter yeah. in Kansas <laughs> history. history yes. So and. Um, and once we deliver this Kickstarter, there might be a new project coming to Kickstarter. I, I'm not gonna, not going to uh, claim that. But uh, could you tell us a little bit about? So, um, you know, we we didn't set this. We didn't set out to start what is becoming a venture-backed uh, open assistant. You know, that will serve a global market. Well, right? and I always say, I'm sorry to interject. I always tell the story. If so, a lot of this creation isn't exactly my own creation story because you did a lot of the actual coding. You did the, a lot of the actual design. So when I tell them the story, um, and I, many already know that Josh and I have been in business together for over. 12 years and we are also married and so when I go out and I'm asked about Mycroft and how did Mycroft come about and I say that he got bored with what we were doing with our day jobs and he accidentally started an artificial intelligence company. It really did sort of happen that way. Yeah. yeah, it was kind of unintentional. So I was going to ask you kind of about running the Kickstarter and how uh, that process went and because that is really the kind of the synthesis of Mycroft as a company. Like before that it was like, hey, we're goofing off and, and I think we, we didn't talk about this form factor, but but this one actually comes after this guy where it was like, hey, we need something smaller that fits on our desk that doesn't take three days to print. Oh yeah. Um, well so, and I don't know that we even talked about this one was going to hang. He was gonna be a little ceiling They were gonna monkey. be ceiling monkeys and actually at one point we were gonna uh, put in a properly sized hole so that you could put Mr. Potato Head arms on it. Oh, I forgot and, about uh, that. The little potato head arms would hang down and this guy would hang down from the ceiling with the uh, with the neck turned around so that you could read the screen. And, uh, and he'd be on the ceiling and turn to face you, which would have you would have re would have involved using an array mic. And uh, and then you can actually, if you if you look here, there's a slot cut over the eye where I was going to put an eyelid that would allow it to blink. And so the idea, you know, from the get-go has really been to create something that's anthropomorphic 
Um, and it was going to have, we were going to have channels, and it was going to have this unit on the desk. Yeah, like you can have a unit on the desk or a unit. Uh, uh, we actually do have a, a under counter or a ceiling mount coming that we're working on so that, that hopefully will be available guy. before we ship. And uh, and so anyway, so can you tell us a little bit, I, I was curious a little bit about kind of the birth of, because I, so, so we did this Kickstarter, we're going to have to do this Kickstarter. And uh, we originally, we sat down as a team and set the goal at $49,000. And uh, the day, which, by the way, if you're running a Kickstarter and you're raising less than $50,000, I think that the, the odds of success were like 30-something percent. And, uh, and so the day before the Kickstarter, I looked at it and then said, you know what, this project's not worth doing, at least from a financial standpoint, unless we can do a minimum of $100,000 in sales. If it's less than that, it really it, it's not going to be worth the effort. And to, to put that in perspective, we're we're delivering these soon. Like I can't tell you how soon, but but a very very ish. soon, uh, we have pallets of plastics coming. The PCB manufacturers have all the components and they're assembling them. And like we're we're moving through the final stages of getting these shipped out the door. We have boxes that are pre-cut and all pretty and whatnot. Um, but the the uh, to go do that really as a commercial enterprise, we, we were gonna need more sales. And so the day before we launched the Kickstarter, I changed the goal from 49,000 to 99,000, which cut our chances of success from 30 something percent to 7%, which I, I didn't even we know. We didn't know. And then I promptly went on, on military leave and uh, <laughs> left uh, Chris and Derek and our, our former CTO, uh, Ryan Sipes, in charge of the Kickstarter while I was merrily doing exercises with uh, with a bunch of captains down at Squadron Officer School. So I was really kind of curious if maybe you could tell us about the, the Kickstarter and, and how that worked and, and why it worked and, and really what that experience was like. Well, there's some of that. Um, that So I did take control of that. I did a little bit of in, uh, investigation. So if you're going to do a Kickstarter, there's a couple of things that you should look at. Um, and I don't know the URLs. I'll actually try to include them um, down below in the video. Down below, quit. <laughs> we have girls who watch YouTube videos too much. But um, I did some investigation. Um, Tim Ferriss has a really great blog. And if you just Google um, Tim Ferriss and Kickstarter, you will get that blog post. And there's some formulas that he talks about. One of his friends ran a very successful Kickstarter campaign. And so um, Derek helped us out a lot with that as far as um, you know, utilizing your email list and utilizing the, your contacts. And so we, we started off with that. We read the Tim Ferriss blog and we, we started off with that, the investigations that we did with Meredith. A lot of what Meredith shared with me and what I was able to take to this project was we wanted to have something that was intriguing. Like she really made her video so that people would be intrigued. As a matter of fact, when she talks about it, she said that she, she purposely had the video be a little bit different so that it would get featured. Um, and that was one of our successful things was we did get featured as well. So um, we did a little bit of investigation, like I said, read the Tim Ferriss blog, um, but also went through, there's uh, some s uh, statistics around how many social media connections you have and your success rate. And those are the blog posts, those are the links I'll try to find and include. So if you don't have as many social media contacts, um, say for instance, you're somebody like Joshua who has in the hundreds of friends, maybe a couple hundred of friends on Facebook and a thousands and thousands on LinkedIn. <laughs> you don't use LinkedIn for uh, Kickstarter. Um, I would highly recommend going and finding a co-founder or not a co-founder, a co-project, uh, co uh, somebody to, to work with your project who has a lot of connections because there are some statistics around how many connections you have and the success rate. So we did a lot of that. I set up all of the social media channels that we are utilizing currently, um, mainly the Facebook page and the Twitter page. I used some IFTTT in order to um, do some automated um, list building and that was really great. I actually don't use that as much anymore after I built a list of people who are tweeting about what I am doing. So um, obviously AI was really key, but in the beginning when I was looking at this, there were a lot, not a lot of people who were tweeting about AI, so I followed a lot of people who were tweeting about IoT. And so that built up a lot of our Twitter list. So I went through, they were tweeting about IoT. I went through and sent them a tweet about our Kickstarter project. And I automated that through Hootsuite. 
And so there were a few tools that I utilized in the very beginning with social media in order to set up the channel and set up the following and to get people excited about it. Um, Hootsuite and um, their um, bulk uploader was something that was key. And so I sent, um, I did some Excel um, spreadsheets where I combined the uh, tweet that I wanted to send with the Twitter handle that I wanted to send it to and the time that I wanted to send it out and it was really key. Same thing, um, Facebook, I just honestly you know, followed some basic formulas about sharing out information and then sharing out that we were doing Facebook stuff out on other channels and that's been more of an organic. Uh, the Twitter account, I really, like I, um, I hand jam that a lot. So I spent a lot of time in the evenings after I was doing my day job, I, after I was taking care of my children, um, at night um, handling all of the social media and sharing out the wonderful video that Derek helped us make about the Kickstarter and sharing out all of the stuff. We had another gentleman, um, Zach Spears, who helped us make videos in the very beginning with Little Cloud Cinema. Um, he was really great. He made some kind of viral little kitschy little videos and um, YouTube and I shared out a lot of the YouTube stuff so YouTube was really key for us in the beginning obviously for our market um, Google Plus and I had some people helping us with Google Plus that's still not something that I've ever been able to understand and unless it is is a market that you are interested in please don't ever try it um, but share, had some people helping us and sharing it out on Google Plus and then it really just was as much as I could get people to talk about it and share about it and reach out to um, media contacts and so we I had some people that reached out to us after we shared you know Derek shared out to the people he knew Joshua shared out to the people he knew and um, same with our other uh, former CTO mm -hmm. and that was how we really like manually got it going we had we built that network from there yep and so as a result of that we got featured in the feature stuff this is from uh, popular science from November um, uh, you know, being featured allowed uh, us to get some mainstream coverage, uh, which has since helped us from the fundraising perspective. Uh, one of the things that we, I don't think we have talked about very much with our community and something that, that the community should probably know is that, you know, we're going to deliver right around 1,200 devices. Uh, we bought another three, 400 devices for, um, for inventory uh, so that we can, we can ship some in the future. Uh, but creating those, uh, the, the final order is actually 1,500 plus whatever, whatever we built in the proof stage. Um, those 1,500 devices, they, they didn't cost 100, you know, we raised $127,520 on Kickstarter. Um, you know, those 1,500 devices are not even remotely covered by that cost. We've spent north of $700,000 building those 1,500 devices. And so the the per unit cost there is substantially more than backers are paying. Um, the bet there for us being that other applications, you know, inside the vehicle, uh, inside other people's products, we're working with a, a number of big brands uh, to deploy the technology will we'll, uh, eventually cover the costs of, of doing the development. But if, you know, it, when one of these lands in your hands, be aware, uh, you know, it probably costs $500 plus to produce each unit. Um, and we are, uh, it turns out, uh, delivering more than we promised. Uh, if you look at the one we took to Kickstarter uh, next to the ones that we're actually producing, you can see it's actually a bit bigger. Um, the reason for that is that we had the Raspberry Pi set uh, 90 degrees, and uh, our design team had the epiphany <laughs> that uh, we could turn it this way and uh, shorten, the, uh, shorten the device. It also got rid of a bunch of cables, and so originally, you know, the unit was going to have, for a basic unit, an Ethernet port and a power supply, and that was it. Um, in the production versions, uh, because Derek and his team have really, really worked hard to, to build something uh, that does surround the Raspberry Pi, uh, we're exposing uh, the Ethernet port, all four USB ports, we're not actually using any of them, uh, 40 pins of I.O. that are split between the Raspberry Pi and the Arduino, uh, RCA out that puts out 192 kilobits per second audio, which should be uh, audio file quality audio, um, along with an HDMI debug port, which will allow you to hook it to a TV and, um, and load libraries like uh, Kodi on, onto the device, which is pretty cool. Um, and so, you know, it, we actually are going to deliver a lot more than we promised, uh, at least from the hardware perspective when we ship. Uh, and that's, I guess, kind of the story of our founding. The Kickstarter is really what, what yeah. made it. 